Let's begin with this, a Fox News alert, evacuate or die. That's the warning from authorities to people in Puerto Rico devastated by Irma. So there's, there's no good news out of this and prayers are needed for this area. Hello, I'm Linda Kincaid. Thanks for joining us for this edition of CNN Newsroom. It's a desperate situation in the U.S. state of Texas right now. Already a dire warning by one official calling it a catastrophic disaster that will go on for years. Guys, this is real. It's straight from a horror movie. It is? No, I'm just saying it looks like one. And it's moving so fast. Look. There was a lot of rain last night, and we know that this catastrophic situation is only going to get worse. Here's the update from the National Weather Service. They said that this is beyond anything it has ever experienced. Just when you thought Hurricane Harvey was bad enough, here comes Hurricane Irma. Hurricane Harvey was a category four when it first hit Texas. There was devastation. That is not Hurricane Harvey. Oh no, that's a new one. That's Hurricane Irma. More storms, bigger storms, worse uh, flooding, more precipitation, more severe. That monster hurricane, the strongest ever on record in the Atlantic Ocean, slamming into the Caribbean already, turning deadly, ravaging islands. And I want to get back to that video. Just listen to the sound as it slams St. Martin. An extremely powerful storm, so many islands getting hammered, many Americans who could not get out in time trying to ride out this hurricane. This satellite image tonight shows the eye of this Category 5 storm fully formed there. Good morning, boy, we're trying to get everybody out of these evacuation zones. Thank you for helping us get our message out. This thing's getting pretty close and it's going to have a big impact on our state. Many are calling Irma's current track the worst case scenario for South Florida. the strongest storm in decades with wind speeds gusting to more than 200 kilometers an hour. Issa, thank you for that. Um, our coverage of Hurricane Irma will continue in just a moment, but let's bring you the breaking news, which is coming out of Mexico. We are getting initial reports of a powerful earthquake striking in the sea off the coast of Chiapas, Mexico. It took only seconds to bring this region to its knees. A devastating, earth-altering 7.1 magnitude quake Tuesday. More than 20 children killed when their elementary school collapsed. This morning, more bodies are being pulled from the rubble. Many are still missing. On the air, a local news anchor warned viewers to stay calm and seek shelter before deciding to take his own advice as the tumbler became more violent. This morning, thousands are living on the streets, too afraid to go back inside. Hours before the quake was triggered, they were marking the 32nd anniversary of the 1985 earthquake here that killed more than 10,000 people. Many people were practicing drills that they then used just hours later. 
Much of California is on fire tonight or at risk of going up in flames. Right now in California, there are th about 30 active fires. We're going to turn now to the threat out west where Los Angeles is dealing with the biggest wildfire in the city's history. The threat from those massive wildfires in California it is growing right now. At least 22 fires burning. Thousands more were forced to evacuate overnight. Officials are calling the inferno a worst case scenario. These fires are just literally uh, burning faster than firefighters can run. Our house is gone, guys! Oh my God, our house is gone! This is absolutely devastating. It's, it's heartbreaking. It is crushing. This looks like another planet. Firefighters are making a desperate stand to save others that are burning. Winds are driving nearly 20 wildfires in California. In the northern end of the state, they call them Diablo devil winds. The wildfire disaster in Northern California is worsening and there appears to be no end in sight. They have already burned more than 70,000 acres and forced 20,000 people to evacuate. Here's Mireya Villarreal. A state of emergency in California as dozens of wildfires burn, including the largest blaze ever recorded in the city of Los Angeles. This is now one of the most destructive wildfires in Northern California's history. People were going every direction, trees were down, it was just covered, it was apocalyptic, it was, it was insane. And neighborhood after neighborhood looks just like this, apocalyptic. 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 That's the word that is being used again and again and again. Uh, it's amazing to realize that all of those scenes that you just watched, uh, they have all happened together, rapid fire, within the last seven or eight weeks. Uh, as one man said, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking, it's, uh, it's devastating, and I can tell you that my family has been praying again and again for people that are in the wake, in the um, front lines of these disasters. Well, welcome to another White Horse Media live webinar called Why Deadly natural disasters. Why deadly disasters? Why is all this happening? What's going on? Uh, are, are we truly in uh, apocalyptic times? Uh, what does the Bible have to say? So I want to welcome everybody. I can see people coming in on the uh, YouTube chat if you would like to ask questions, which we'll get to when I'm done with my presentation. I'll be taking your questions live. Uh, I want to welcome, uh, I can't pronounce your name, but somebody from the uh, Czech Republic has logged in, and I see um, Mike from Florida and Paula from Washington, and I'm sure there are others that are that are logging in and tuning in and watching in from around the world. So, welcome here. We're live. Uh, whether we make mistakes or not, we're just going to keep going. And so, uh, let's start with prayer. Let's pray that God will will be with us and help us and uh, touch all of our hearts and. Bring us closer to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray for your help, for your Holy Spirit, that you will uh, bless the technology, that you will bless uh, this webinar, that you will help me, and that you will speak to all of our hearts about the apocalyptic times that we are living in, and that, uh, that Jesus really is coming soon. Bless us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Well, you've seen a lot of clips on the screen, and I'm just going to start out here with an article from the Washington Post that said it better than I, than I could say it. This is uh, September 23rd. The title of the article is called Harvey Irma Maria, Why Is This Hurricane Season So Bad? And I'm quoting, the 2017 hurricane season has been a full-on assault from Mother Nature. We are under siege, and our attackers have benign names like Harvey and Irma and Maria, but they are callous, powerful, indiscriminate, terrifying, destructive, merciless, and relentless. Is Earth trying to eject us from the planet? Again and again, the harshest of winds and hardest of rains has pounded on the most defenseless territories that we have. Nearly a full month of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back disasters. Now, this is right from, uh, from the news. Uh, the U.S. has never been hit by three storms this strong 
in the same season in modern records. Hurricane Harvey seemed to spin up in an instant before hitting land on August 26, only to come to rest for days over southeast Texas and southwest Louisiana. A mind-boggling 19 trillion gallons of rain fell in that storm, which triggered unprecedented flooding. And it just seemed like, you know, just as that devastation was, uh, as America was, you know, reeling over this, and especially Texas and Louisiana, then right on, on the heels of it came Hurricane Irma, one of the strongest ever recorded in the Atlantic Ocean. When Irma maintained 180 miles per hour wind speeds for 37 hours, it set a record for a most intense storm for such a long duration anywhere on Earth. It made landfall September 10, staffing, strafing the Florida Keys before terrorizing both Florida coasts in vastly different ways. It knocked out power to millions of people, and some are still waiting for the lights to come back on. And right after Irma, then hit Maria. It made landfall in Puerto Rico 10 days later as the strongest storm to hit the island since 1928. It thrashed the U.S. territory with winds over 100 miles per hour and more than 30 inches of rain. All of Puerto Rico lost power and was under flash flood warnings. The full extent of the damage and the loss of life will not be known for some time. It can take months to restore the infrastructure, and they're still struggling as a result of that hurricane. And the article says from the Washington Post, all of this in just four weeks. Just four weeks. And if that wasn't enough, in a short time, the earth began to rattle. And let me continue with another article from the New York Times. And uh, the New York Times is, is a very secular um, publication. It's no secret you know, that that's a fact. They're not particularly religious, but their headline here is called Apocalyptic Thoughts. Amid nature's chaos, you could be forgiven. This came out September 8. And the article said, vicious hurricanes all in a row, one having swamped Houston, another about to buzz through Florida after ripping up the Caribbean. Wildfires bursting out uh, all over the West after a season of scorching hot temperatures and years of dryness. And late Thursday night off the coast of Mexico, a monster of an earthquake. You could be forgiven for thinking apocalyptic thoughts. Uh, and then it quotes a man who said, it sure feels like the end times are getting a few dress rehearsals right now. So here's the New York Times, uh, and again, the title is Apocalyptic Thoughts Amid Nature's Chaos, You Could Be Forgiven. And the idea of, of you could be forgiven is, you know, we don't generally, they're basically saying we don't generally believe that, uh, you know, the Bible's true or that the end times are real, but in the light of all the things that are just crashing down one after another, back to back to back to back, uh, you could be forgiven if you think that maybe something big is happening and maybe we are entering into the end times. Well, the sequence, uh, unfortunately, didn't stop there. Uh, September 7, an 8.1 earthquake hit off the coast of southern Mexico. Twelve days later, a 7.1 earthquake shook uh, and killed a lot of people not far from Mexico City, about 100 miles away. Both of these uh, were deadly, deadly quakes. When October arrived, America took a breath, hoping that after all of these hurricanes and, uh, uh, and these earthquakes and storms, that maybe uh, Mother Nature or something would, would let up. But it was not to be. On the night of October 1, first day of October, from the 32nd floor of a luxury hotel, a gunman opened fire upon a group of concert goers who were uh, at a country music festival on the strip of Las Vegas. And he killed 59 people, uh, that's the latest figure that we have, and injuring over 500. An article followed in USA Today. And the title of this article is Storms, Earthquakes, North Korea, and you know about the, you know, the rattling that's going on between Trump and the uh, president of North Korea. You know, we are on the edge of a potential nuclear, nuclear showdown. And so the article says, storms, earthquakes, North Korea, and now the Las Vegas massacre. We have to wonder what's next. You know, could there be anything else that's going to hit us 
uh, rapid fire. And this article says, when the month began, a confluence of hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, wildfires, and a brewing international nuclear confrontation already had some Americans thinking about the end times. So just like the New York Times, here we have uh, USA Today, and these are, these are secular publications, but they're using words uh, like end times, they're talking about the apocalypse, they're using language uh, from the Bible because they recognize that this is just a very amazing and unusual and un unprecedented sequence of disasters. It says, then Las Vegas, the nation's playground, witnessed the worst mass shooting in U.S. history, the latest in this peerless series of catastrophes. Uh, peerless meaning, you know, there's just, there's nothing like it. We've never really seen anything like this. Uh, and then it says, no matter how bad things are, they apparently can get worse. Can they get worse? <laughs> what next? Well, uh, America didn't have long to wait, even though there had been fires raging in uh, California, Wyoming, Washington, Idaho, Montana, different parts of the West, uh, then something terrible, uh, an, an unprecedented, un unbelievable hit on the night of October 8. So this was just a week after Las Vegas. A night, the night of October 8, a new cluster of deadly wildfires broke out in Northern California around the Napa Valley area, which is the, uh, the United States capital uh, of the production of, of wine and alcohol. And a lot of marijuana grown there too. And a lot of other things going on in that area. Anyway, uh, many of those fires are still burning right now. And uh, if you've seen the pictures of what you can see on the screen here, if you have seen those pictures of uh, Santa Rosa, it's, it's just uh, amazing. Uh, whole neighborhoods just wiped off the map. Just uh, Last I read, about 6,000 homes and businesses have been completely consumed. And these fires, uh, it was a cluster of fires, and they just started just during the night, and wham! Uh, they were driven by fierce, fierce winds. Uh, one of the winds, the main wind, is called a, a Diablo, which really means uh, devil, uh, a devil wind. And it just uh, fueled these fires and did more damage than we can possibly imagine. Uh, my wife and my children, we've been praying for the people of Northern California. California is my home state. And at this moment, officially, there still really is no uh, solid uh, evidence, at least that's being produced by the media, uh, or at least reported by the media, uh, as to what has caused these fires. Nobody knows. But we uh, at Whitehorse Media, we, we think we may have an answer. And I'd like to turn this time over to uh, Pastor Ron Fleck. He's in our control room. We'll give you a bird's eye view of what he's doing. And he's going to share some fascinating information about what may have started these fires in Northern California. Ron, we're going to you. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, you know, Steve mentioned that he has family uh, in California and he's from California. My wife and all of her family are not only from California, but right there in the San Francisco North Bay area. Uh, her family is in Petaluma. My son was born in Santa Rosa, so we have friends. Uh, we've been paying close attention. Last week, as these fires were just all over the news and uh, people were really on top of uh, staying, you know, watching these, uh, Steve and I were, were talking, I think it was last Wednesday, and we were talking uh, not only about the fires, but someone had emailed us here at Whitehorse Media in regards to uh, meteorites and fireballs. In the news, there's been a lot of talk of an asteroid, 2012 TC4, an asteroid that uh, was close to Earth here on the 12th and 13th. And so there was a lot of buzz on the internet about some of these different things. And we just happened to be uh, reading and, and discussing this when I found a very interesting uh, video that has to do with potentially how these fire started. And so what I'd like to do is uh, play you a, an edited clip uh, of that video and then we'll jump back onto my computer. I'll show you a few things and maybe we're onto something, maybe we're not. But 
Let's go ahead and, and watch this video. Right now, on with the video. This whole video is uh, basically because I want to thank somebody, and here's the channel, King Havy. Um, not only is this his channel, this is his personal video he filmed from his car on his dash cam, which, guys, it shows literally a meteor becoming a meteorite because it comes right down to the ground on tape on his way in the same direction as Napa, California. This is the exact area where these fires happened, and this guy, I believe his name is Kyle, and I only know this because this is his post on American Meteor Society. So, what this kid, or what this guy did, I hope he's not a kid, hope that's not insulting to him, what this person did is amazing. Not only did he film this totally by chance, he just had his camera on. You can see he's been using it for about a day um, unless it resets, so it's not like he turned this on at this immediate moment to make a fake video or something. He's been using this camera for over a day. It'll reset back to tw uh, 2001, 1, January 1st, because sometimes if you don't lock the date in, every time you unplug it or clear the memory card, the date resets. So for anyone that wants to give him a hard time on this, this has already been verified. This is a common issue with these cameras, and the way he verified the time and date, because he knew this would happen, which was so smart, was he went on to American Meteor Society, he signed up, and he reported his meteor sighting. And it's right here, 1946, which is 746 uh, Pacific Time, which is, what time did he write down here? 747. So th he verified the time, and not only that, but they verify these times, I believe, uh, one way or another, with an internal clock. I'm not sure exactly how they do it, but nonetheless, here is Kyle's post right here, 746. And then really quick, guys, I want you to notice all these other sightings, all within 20, 36 minutes. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different reports from 7 different names, almost 7 different uh, experience levels, which goes to show you that this isn't one person posting all these. These are legit postings. Not only that, but we have 1, 2, 3, 4. Four at exactly eight tw or t eight o'clock rather, which is the twentieth hour uh, military time. Twenty is eight, so it's eight p.m., which is leading up to the times of the fires being verified. Now, some people were saying, "Oh, uh, if the meteors landed at eight and the fire started at eleven, how is it possibly a meteor?" Well, guys, it's you got to understand we're we're being too conditioned with movies that every time a meteor comes to the ground, it's this giant fireball of napalm and hits the ground and blows away everything it touches. That's not really how these work. These can be little tiny rocks the size of a, a pebble you pick up and skip across a pond. Um, but what they start out as is the issue. They start out as meteors, which could be the size of houses, they could be the size of cars, but by the time they get to Earth, if they even make it to Earth, um, which is when they become meteorites, they're usually very small. I believe there was a report of one in Africa, I, maybe last year, of 8.8 .8 pounds, and it had like a bunch of media on it because that's one of the bigger ones. So you got to realize what these things are uh, before you know we get caught up in the whole Hollywood thing. That th these things don't come down to Earth and destroy and, c and create big uh, craters in the ground. That would be an asteroid or a comet that would do something like that. Um, so hopefully we won't see any of those. But again, here is the video. This is his personal video from his car. And here we go. I'm going to play it. It's only in the beginning of the video that we need to see here. There's the light. It comes down. You can see a tail branch off, and then it dives behind a landmass. And what does that tell you guys? That means that this thing is low enough to where a rolling hill or a mountain in the background actually blocked our view of it, which means it's close to the ground. When you see meteors or shooting stars, usually they're moving, at least from your perspective when you're looking at them, either left to right or right to left and very high up in the air. This one is looks like it's coming straight down, so it may be coming at an angle from the atmosphere, maybe in this area, who knows. But regardless, this thing is close to the ground. You can see it again right there. There's one tail, and there it goes behind a... a a landmass. So this thing is low. This thing drops to the ground. Those are all the exact signs of a meteor. And I even cut this part of the video out and blew it up for you guys so we can really get a detail on this. Now check this out. Again, this is Kyle's video. There it is. There's one tail, two tail. You, you cannot tell me that is not a meteor. That is an absolute meteor, more than likely a meteorite that landed in the ground. 
and it goes behind a mountain or even some trees. That's how low it is. Uh, that tree cover in the horizon blocked this thing's view. That means it's very close to the ground. Chances are it hit the ground. So here we go. Now we have video evidence of uh, these fireballs in the sky that so many people were reporting. I have a list of th over 30 people now that have personally contacted me and I have their names and everything just for the people that want to question that. I can give you these names and you can also go and talk to these people. Most of them have YouTube channels. They all are from California. They all saw um, fireballs and meteors and some even claim they saw meteorites. Now again a meteorite is a meteor that hits the ground so unless they saw this with their own eyes um, there is a question there but if you see a meteor get as low to the point where it goes behind trees or behind a mountain in the foreground yes that thing is more than likely going to hit the ground That is an absolute meteor. And guys, when we get meteors that hit the ground, they hit at such a speed that just because they may not be a big giant ball of fire, just the friction alone can cause minor fires. And then a couple hours later, as these fires begin to grow, that's when they notice them. And that's where you get that, ex that explanation of why a meteor could come around 8 o'clock and then not get a, a fire until 11. It's only because we didn't report the fire until 11 until it was big enough to notice. This thing probably started off as like a little maybe 8 foot by 8 foot radius of you know smoldering leaves who knows and then turned into a fire but regardless guys th the point I'm trying to make here is that we have people uh, trying to just explain this away with simple like oh yeah it's it's really hot in California and and this and that and you know what it was hot five days ago too why didn't this happen five days ago why do we have five fires in the same exact area in different areas believe it or not but in the same uh, geographical area of California in Napa County all starting at the exact same time and then in turn those fires caused other fires which would then bring those other explanations into you know legitimacy but you gotta realize guys you can watch a satellite video of these fires and they all show the same signs of development at the same time so these all happen at the same time so unless we had five or six people in the woods that were on walkie-talkies you know lighting lighters and starting fires at the same time the only other logical explanation for this is what we're seeing here in this video wow so that that was pretty amazing when we saw that uh, it was something that we decided needed some further research and so that's exactly uh, what we did or what I did and I just want to take you to my computer you're looking at a screen sh screenshot of my my laptop and here is the American Meteor Society that the gentleman on the video was just mentioning and you can see here uh, that it's not hard. Someone can go right up there. They can report a fireball. You can report uh, different meteors. You can do all kinds of things with this website. And one thing I want to draw your attention to since the airing of that video is that there have been quite a few people, uh, quite a few more people who have jumped on there and who have reported. Uh, in the video clip we saw, there were seven. Now that number, I think there's 17 here. And so you go all the way down, George and Adam, and if you were to go to this site and click on there, you'll get a detailed description of what they reported um, all the way on down. And if you look over here, here is a map of the San Francisco uh, Bay Area with the fires that are still burning being up here in Santa Rosa. You have the Napa Valley, St. Helena. And if you look over here to your right, as I go over to this gentleman, Kyle, you see the little camera there, you see him jumping up and down. That is where Kyle was when he was driving, when his dash cam caught that, that video of a fireball. And if you remember, it was coming very low on the horizon from his upper left uh, down to his right. And I want to take you uh, to Google Earth and just show you exactly where that would be. This is exactly where according to his report he was driving this is highway 160 he's coming along here if you looked in the video there was a sign coming up for uh, indicating the road was going to bend to the left if you're going to go over here to rio vista and i just earlier took a line 
and extended it off that road. So if you were driving on this road and you were, you were looking off into the distance, where would that actually take you? And you'll see here, let me just get this down a little bit. There we go. That line takes you right up over these mountains, as he was indicating, as the video indicated. It looked as if that fireball was, was coming down and, and maybe going behind. He mentioned trees, but if you look here on this line, there are a couple different ridges. Now, this is a straight line. If you were to take this line and just bend it a little bit up here, because remember, the meteor was coming from the left down to the right. This is in the the general direction right in here, we don't know exactly, but somewhere right up in there, but right there is where the fire started. This is the Napa Valley right in here. Santa Rosa's just over this ridge. The fires, according to reports, just came blazing over these mountains, uh, unstoppable and right into those, those suburbs. So, um, more than interesting. Could this really happen? You're, you're maybe thinking to yourself, you guys are getting out there. Uh, how can a meteorite start a fire? Well, check this out. You look over here at the date, October 4, less than a week prior to these fires starting in California. Here we have the Union Leader, which is a paper in New Hampshire. Woodstock forest fire, perhaps caused by meteor, may take another day to bring under control. Reporting here from the Boston Globe, and we will uh, place the links to these articles in the description uh, in, on our YouTube channel. Meteorite may have sparked a New Hampshire blaze that's been burning since Tuesday. And one more over here, chief uh, meteor spotted in sky before fire breaks out in White Mountains all referencing the same fire. So is it possible? It sure seems like it. Back over on that website, can't, can't move on without sharing this. We, we talk often of you know, the, the increase of earthquakes and floods and tornadoes, which we've, we, which we've always had, but look at this. From 2006, 500 reported total events, Working up 2011, 2012, look at this. We're in 2017, but look, 2016. We're not done with 2017 yet, but we're already up into 3,750 reports, 5,362 last year. So friends, these things uh, are happening. Now I wanna show you one uh, last quick video here. Well, fire crews are battling a forest fire in New Hampshire that may have been started by a meteorite. Before the fire started, a driver in the area reported seeing a meteorite flash across the sky, but officials say they haven't yet found any evidence of a meteorite just yet. The fire chief says the blaze doubled in size overnight, growing to roughly 50 acres. Yeah, so it is very possible uh, that this is what's going on. And so, Steve, you know, the, the, uh, the papers are indicating they don't know for sure. They're saying possibly electrical fires from down power lines. But again, all those fires starting at the same time uh, in those Diablo winds, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I've got quite a bit on my mind that I'll be sharing with you. And... Uh I think it's amazing, Pastor Ron, and thank you for the research that, that you are doing and, and you have done and continue to do and that you're sharing this with a lot of people right now. Just to let you know, we've got people that have logged in uh, from Canada, Poland, Costa Rica, Hong Kong, Portugal, and France. And so this information is, is going out to a lot of people. A and just for the record, you know, we, we are not saying for sure that those fires were started by a, a meteor or a fireball, but uh, and the evidence uh, of all of these sightings is uh, very significant for us to look at. And, uh, and as Pastor Ron has also shared with me, a meteor breaking up would break up into different parts. And the fact is that the Northern California fires, at least in the Napa Valley area, uh, it, we're dealing with a cluster of fires that started at the same time, not just, not just one. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Whitehorse Media and who have been following us for a while, uh, 
you know that two summers ago, we were involved in a very uh, amazing and significant event in Nashville, Tennessee, where we talked specifically about fireballs and predictions of coming fireballs in the end times. We have a lot of research that is in a flyer that we'll make available uh, at the end. We'll have a picture of this on the screen. It's called Fire from the Sky. And in Fire from the Sky, uh, we, we document information about fireballs and we take a look at some dreams that uh, occurred in the early 1900s inside the, the head of a woman named Ellen White. Ellen White is widely recognized as a uh, 19th century, 20th century, early 20th century woman who was given a prophetic gift. Uh, she's written widely on many subjects. In fact, she is the most translated uh, American author of all time. Uh, her influence was written up in the uh, prestigious Smithsonian Institute magazine. And anyway, uh, in 1904 and in 1906, she had a series of dreams uh, talking about some kind of, or where she was given information uh, about fireballs coming down in the future uh, and, and doing tremendous damage. And I'd like to put a a quotation from her on the screen and I'll just uh, share with you what she, one of the things that she wrote, one of her dreams, uh, this is from the book Last Day Events and I've got this book right in front of me, page 24, you can find it here if you're familiar with this book Last Day Events, it's got a lot of her statements and her uh, prophetic revelations that are very consistent with the Bible and that look into the future and Actually, before I read what you see here on the screen, uh, let me share a, a, another quotation. In 1897, she wrote, In the last scenes of this Earth's history, war will rage. There will be pestilence, plague, and famine. The waters of the deep will overflow their boundaries. Property and life will be destroyed by fire and flood. We should be preparing for the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for them that love him. And that certainly is good counsel. Preparing our hearts, preparing our lives, our homes, as many people as we can help to help them get ready for Jesus and his coming. Now here's the dream that you see uh, on, on my right. It says, last Friday morning, and this dream she had this in 1906. Last Friday morning, just before I awoke, a very impressive scene was presented before me. I seemed to awake from sleep but was not in my home. From the windows, I could behold a terrible conflagration. Now, it's interesting that she uses this word, uh, conflagration. If you, if you look down here, you'll see a, uh, a quotation from uh, Wikipedia that defines the word conflagration. It says that it is an extensive fire that destroys a great deal of land or property, uh, and synonyms are fire, and blaze, flames, inferno, and the last word there is uh, firestorm. Firestorm, now what happened in Northern California uh, was not just a fire. Uh, it is being called a firestorm, which is exactly what it was, a whole cluster of fires that were driven by these fierce winds and they caused this destruction. Now back to the quotation from Ellen White. She says, great balls of fire were falling upon houses, and from these balls, fiery arrows were flying in every direction. It was impossible to check the fires that were kindled. Impossible to check the fires. And that's what happened in Northern California. Uh, at least for, for a, a goodly amount of time, those fires could not be checked. The firemen, at, at first, weren't even fighting them because they knew you can't stop this. The main thing, their first priority, was to uh, help people get out of the area, and then once that happened, then eventually they turned to the uh, trying to fight the fires themselves. But at first, they, they just they knew you can't stop this. Uh, it's driven by these devil winds coming uh, in Northern California. And anyway, uh, she wrote this. She wrote a hundred years ago that there would be conflagrations, there would be fireballs, there would be fires that could not be stopped. And it says uh, many places were being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. After a time, I awoke and found myself at home. 
At Whitehorse Media, we, we don't believe that we've seen the last of these fireballs. Uh, we think that this is just on a small scale, and as big as it is, it's still on a small scale compared to some of the things that she actually saw. And we expect, we firmly believe that we're going to see, the world is going to see more of these uh, uh, a fireball activity. Now, you know, whether they're exactly meteors or not, we can't say for sure because we don't have that detail, but the, the evidence seems to fit. It seems to fit a pattern, and it would certainly make sense that, uh, you know, these things would come down from the skies in increasing numbers as we get closer to the coming of Jesus, Jesus Christ. That's what we're here to talk about, and we'll be getting to that in just a few few moments looking at what the Bible has to say. Uh, anyway, believe it or not, these disasters, you know, they're still not over. Uh, they haven't ended. There's another hurricane that two days ago called Ophelia formed out in the Atlantic and hit Europe. Now, this typically does not happen. Most hurricanes that uh, form out in the Atlantic or the Caribbean, they move toward America. Uh, but this one hit Europe. It hit Ire the area of, of Ireland. And, uh, and it's making the news that this is not normal, this is unusual, and people are wondering, is this an omen of things to come? This is, uh, Ophelia is number 10, the 10th hurricane of this season, which tops out the record, and I read that if there's one more, one more hurricane for this season, that that will break all records. There's never been 11 hurricanes uh, in, in one season. So back to our original question. What does all of this mean? What's going on in this world? Why is there a, a peerless series of disasters? Uh, major secular publications are talking about the end times. Uh, reporters are using the word uh, apocalyptic. Uh, they're talking about uh, a sequence that's unprecedented. What's going on? Why is this happening? Can we find any information in this book, in the Word of God, in the ancient Bible, which is so relevant that talks about things that are actually happening right in front of our eyes. Well, let, let me share some texts and I'll, I've got a presentation to continue on with and then we'll take your questions. I can see that uh, more and more people are logging in to our, our YouTube channel. So let me just share a few, few scriptures. If you have a Bible and if you want to follow along, turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke 21 is an amazing chapter. It's uh, one of the chapters where Jesus uh, looked into the future from 2,000 years ago and looked at things that would be happening right before he returns. Luke chapter 21, verse 11. Jesus said, There will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Uh, notice the word signs. Jesus said signs would happen. Signs up there. Verse 25, he continues on, and he said that there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, signs up in the heavens. And upon the earth, there would be distress of nations with per perplexity. That word uh, distress sounds a lot like the word stress, which uh, perfectly describes life in 2017. These are stress-filled days. And Jesus said there would be distress on earth, distress among the nations. With perplexity, the Original Greek word for perplexity means with no way out. There's no, in other words, there's no solution. Governments, presidents, kings, organizations, the United Nations, uh, add them all up together. They cannot solve these kind of problems, not as they continue to increase. The sea and the waves roaring, which sounds like a huge uh, tsunami. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Now here Jesus seems to be describing a time when people will be uh, looking at different things happening in nature and they'll be, these things will be so fearful that they, their hearts will practically fail them because of the expectation of things which are coming upon the earth. And to me that sounds like a time where through satellite and, and uh, television and the internet uh, and NASA, uh, telescopes, we can actually see, you know, things that may be coming down from the sky. We can see things that are happening on earth. And as, they, as these things get really bad, people are going to just be terrified of, of what is coming next, what is going to be happening upon the earth. And then Jesus tells us what 
will be next, the ultimate next, the final next, what next, like the, one of the uh, media reports I read. Verse 27, Jesus said, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The, the phrase Son of Man is Jesus' reference to himself. He called himself the Son of Man. And he said the next event is that people are going to see not just these things that are coming upon the earth, but they're going to see him coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Uh, in other words, there's going to be a time when we look at these things that are happening and we, we should be looking up because we know that Jesus is getting ready to come. The second coming is getting close. It is getting, it is drawing near. And that's the word that Jesus used. Now, some people might think, well, uh, you know, Steve, uh, there's, there's been hurricanes for a long time. There have been earthquakes for a long time, fires for a long time, floods, etc. If you look at any one of these different disasters, uh, you know, they've been going on for a long time. What makes you think that these really are the end times? That we really are uh, in the time where Jesus said that his coming is near. H how do we know that? Well, let me put uh, a couple pieces together for you. Actually, I want to read another text first in the book of Joel. Joel is a little Old Testament, Old Testament book that also talks about the end times. And in chapter 2, here's another statement about the final times that just sounds just like our day. Jesus said, or the Bible says, I will show, this is verse 30, Joel chapter 2, verse 30. I will, God says, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, which parallels what Jesus said in Luke 21. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Just go to Northern California, you'll see those pillars, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So uh, here again is a biblical picture of what would be happening before the day of the Lord, before God comes, before Jesus comes, before the apocalyptic end. Now, back to the question of, well, these things have been going on for a long time. You know, they've been happening for thousands of years. Uh, let me share a very interesting text with you. Prophecy in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you've got a Bible, follow along. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. <coughs> Verse 1, the heading here is the day of the Lord. Verse 1 says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. In other words, concerning the exact time when this is going to happen, the exact season, you know, is it what month? Uh, is it going to be spring, winter, summer, or fall? When Jesus comes, we don't know exactly. But verse 2 says, But uh, you yourselves do know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. It's going to come, and the thief idea means unexpected. It's going to be an unexpected event. And then notice verse 3 says, For when they shall say peace and safety, in other words, hey, these things have been happening for a long time, uh, nothing new here. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, think about that. Uh, Paul, who wrote this, compares what's happening right before Jesus comes, before the day of the Lord, as labor pains uh, upon coming upon a pregnant woman. Now, just think about this. When a, you know, my wife has had two children. Uh, we've had two children, uh, Seth and Abby. And when a woman uh, conceives and a baby begins to grow inside of her, uh, the baby does not come out right away, obviously. There's still a nine-month period. And when you get down toward the day of birth, the day of delivery, then what happens is those, uh, those labor pains start, those, those birth pains, uh, contractions, and they increase uh, rapidly. And then there's a whole series of them that take place, and then the baby's born. And so the, the idea of birth pains, birth pains, which Paul uses in uh, First Thessalonians, uh, it suggests the idea that there is going to be a, an increased 
sequence of contractions and of labor pains that are going to happen on earth right before the day of God. And I tell you, uh, we are seeing an increase of these disasters. You've looked at the reports that I've just shared with you. Rapid fire, the media's calling them back to back to back to back disasters. A peerless series of events that has, has no precedent. Uh, monster storms, one after another after another. And then you've got earthquakes, you've got uh, fires, you've got uh, murder, and, and I'm going to share some more insights into these things which are exactly described in the Bible. But anyway, as I'm looking at all this, I mean, you can be skeptical if you want to be. Uh, like people were in the days of Noah, you know, they, they didn't believe Noah's message. They thought the flood would never come, but it did come. And we are convinced that Jesus is coming and we see plenty of evidence around us that we are truly living in apocalyptic times. We are living in the time of the end. Uh, not long before Jesus Christ returns, as the Bible, as the Bible says. Now, here's here's one other text along these lines, in Romans chapter eight, verse twenty-two. Paul again uses the expression "birth pains," birth pangs, and this is this is interesting. He says, "We know," this is Romans eight twenty-two. We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Now when you compare this text with 1 Thessalonians 5, put the pieces together, it tells me that the birth pangs that Paul uh, was talking about in 1 Thessalonians before the day of Jesus, that especially are those contractions going to be seen in nature. In the, in the natural world around us. It says here that the whole earth will be, the whole creation will be groaning and laboring with these birth pangs. So that tells me that uh, we are going to be seeing a sequence of an increase in convulsions in nature and that these are signs that Jesus Christ is coming again. So uh, point number one is that what we're seeing around us are signs, they're birth pains, that Jesus is getting ready to come, that we are truly living in the times before the day of God. Now, another point I want to make, and I'll just tell you what it is and we'll take a look at it in the book of Job. If you turn to the book of Job, uh, and here's the point, is that these signs also tell us something else. So this goes back to the question, why? You know, why are these deadly, disasters occurring rapid fire right now. Well, another reason is that these signs are telling us that God is, is removing his hand of protection over this world. And that's why we're seeing these things increase. Now, let me share some thoughts on this from the book of Job. Job, uh, some scholars say, was the oldest first book of the Bible ever written, uh, oldest Bible book that we have. And it's very interesting what happens in Joel, or Job chapter one, chapter one and two. Verse one says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. So this is important. Uh, Job's character was one of, uh, of, of purity and righteousness. Job was a good man. Job loved God, he hated evil, he stayed away from evil, he lived a godly life. And then the Bible says in verse, uh, verse 6 that there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the, Lord and, before the Lord and Satan also came among them. So here comes the devil into a, a heavenly council meeting which uh, apparently or it suggests that the different uh, representatives in this council meeting represented different territories. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Where, which territory are you from? And verse 7 says, Satan answered the Lord, and he said, from going to and fro on the earth. I'm, I'm from the earth. The earth is a planet under my control because Adam and Eve uh, sinned, according to Genesis chapter 3, and that gave uh, Satan a certain, a certain amount of dominion uh, and, and rule over this planet. And he said, I, I've, I've come from the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, uh, 
He's blameless, he's upright, he fears God, and he shuns evil. And then the, Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? He basically said, oh, he said, God, uh, Job only serves you because you, you, you protect him and you give him all these good things. And if you, if you remove your protection from him, we'll see what happens. Uh, verse, verse 10, the devil said, have you not made a hedge around him? In other words, it's like a barrier. It's a protecting wall around Job. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? So three things, the person, the family, and uh, his possessions were all being protected by God because Job was a righteous man. And then uh, the devil said, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. You know, what a, what a devil, you know, telling God he's going to curse you because he really doesn't love you. He's not, not unselfishly, he's serving you because of all the good things you give him. And so the Lord uh, took the challenge. Verse 12 says, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And the scripture again says that God gave uh, Job and his family over to Satan's power. Now, as you keep reading, now this is where it gets really interesting in the light of what's happening today. In verse 13, it says, There was a day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans raided them, and they took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So here is a group of, uh, of marauders who, because God's protection has been withdrawn, you have murderers coming in, killing the animals, and killing some of Job's servants. And then verse uh, 16 says, while well, this first messenger was speaking, another one came and said, the fire of God, the fire of God, which is what they thought as they saw this, fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants and has consumed them, and I alone have, have escaped to tell you. So first you have uh, murderers and then you have fire doing uh, its destructive work. And then it says, while he was still speaking, another came and says, and said, and then he talked about the Chaldeans uh, doing similar work as the Sabaeans, which were more people who were performing, uh, who, who were murderers. They killed with the edge of the sword and I alone have come to tell you. Verse 18 says, while he was still speaking, another came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So here we have uh, three kinds of disasters when God removed his hedge to some extent and gave Satan power over Job's uh, family and over his possessions. We have murder taking place. We have fire doing its destructive work. And then we have uh, a great uh, storm also uh, destroying. Now, isn't that interesting? Aren't those exactly the things that we have seen in the last two months uh, in, in this peerless sequence of disasters. We have the Las Vegas uh, shower of bullets that came down from the 32nd floor. We have these hurricanes back to back. We have fires in many states, including California. And that is what the Bible uh, is also referring to, the very same things, murders, storms, and fires. And so the question that uh, we want to ask is, you know, can these things be happening today? Is it possible that what's happening today is that God is removing his hedge, his, uh, his barrier of protection over planet Earth uh, increasingly because humanity is uh, increasingly acting unlike Job. Job was righteous. He feared God. He hated evil. He did what was right and God protected him. And that implies that if people go in the opposite direction, if they don't 
fear God, if they don't follow him, if they don't uh, keep the Ten Commandments, if they don't follow more principles, then uh, as time goes on, God is going to withdraw more and more his protection from a wicked planet uh, that is uh, going in every direction other than his direction. Is that what we're seeing? Uh, we believe that is exactly what's happening right now. Let me share a few more uh, quotations from the book, The Great Controversy. Some of you have read this. This book was also written by Ellen White in the 1800s, looking down into the final days and describing what would be happening. Uh, and Pastor Ron's going to put a quotation on the screen here, and you can follow along. You can see that right there. This is from The Great Controversy, page 589 and 90. Now listen carefully. It says, Satan works through the elements, also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature, and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to afflict Job, this book is going back to what the Bible says, it's based on the Bible, describing what happened in Job 1. How quickly flocks and herds, servants' houses, children were swept away. One trouble succeeding another as in a moment. So not only was uh, what happened in Job 1, uh, you know, murder and fire and uh, storm, but it shows in Job 1 that it was a rapid sequence. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing rapid sequences of events one after another. So that's another par parallel. Then listen to this. It is God who shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And it's not just the Christian world that uh, doesn't really show that much of an interest in the Ten Commandments. But of course, it's the secular world also at large. It's the, the entire world that is going against God's law. And then it says, and the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would do. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. He will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs, but he will bring trouble upon others. And then he will lead them to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. So when all these bad things happen, then Satan turns around and tries to convince people that uh, you know, God is a bad guy, God is mean, and that's why these things are happening. But really, ultimately, behind the scenes is the devil. Now, keep going. It says, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work. Listen to this. Even now he is at work. In accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, which is the same word we read in Ellen White's dream and uh, what surely happened in Northern California, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms and tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. And remember, in the book of Job, uh, the Lord said to the devil, he said, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. God gave uh, Job's possessions and family over into Satan's power uh, as, a, as, a, as a test to prove for generations to come that there can be people on earth who fear God and love God, not just because he gives them things, but because he's good. And when you keep reading the book of Job, you find out that Job did not charge God with wrong. He didn't sin with his lips. He maintained his integrity and stood fast for the Lord. Anyway, back to great controversy. In a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest and famine and distress follow. He also imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. I wonder if some of that deadly taint has to do with smoke, where you can't hardly breathe, and, and pollution, I'm sure. And then listen to this. It says, these visitations are to become more and more frequent 
and disastrous. They're going to increase like birth pains upon the earth. Destruction will be upon man and beast. The earth more, and this is quoting Isaiah 24. The, uh, it says, the earth mourns and fades away. The haughty people do languish, which means the proud people of the earth. The earth also, also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. So Isaiah pinpoints the reason why earth falls apart when you read the whole chapter is because humanity is uh, proud and uh, defiling uh, themselves and God's earth and that they have transgressed his law. And that's what the prophet says in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 4 and 5. Now here's one more quote from the Great Controversy. Page 614 goes back to Old Testament days where a single angel, this is in the book of Isaiah, uh, destroyed all the, oh I'm sorry, a single angel destroyed all the firstborn in, of the Egyptians, that's in the book of Exodus, and filled the land with mourning. When David offended against God, by numbering the people, one angel caused a terrible destruction by which his sin was punished. Uh, I was thinking of an angel destroying the Assyrians uh, in the book of Isaiah, but we find many examples of this in Exodus and other, other chapters where God has commanded angels to uh, do destructive work because people have been, have been so wicked. But then it says here, continuing, that the same destructive power the same destructive power exercised by holy angels in the Old Testament when God commanded will be exercised by evil angels when he permits. So God can either command or permit. He can uh, send judgments when, uh, that's when he deems it necessary and people have crossed the line in wickedness and he can also withdraw his hand and he can allow the devil to exercise his power in destructive ways because people have refused to obey God and to follow his law and to, uh, to trust in him and his protection. The same destructive power exercised by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when he permits, like he permitted the devil to do what he did to Job. And then it says, this is the last part, there are forces now ready, and I want you to really think about this and take this to heart. There are forces now ready and only waiting the divine permission to spread desolation everywhere. Wow. And this tells me and the Bible tells me that God is, uh, you know, any, any uh, semblance of peace and happiness that we have in this world is because uh, our, our loving creator is protecting us from forces of evil that would kill us in a minute kill us in a minute and I'm just you know I told my kids this I've told my wife this that when we kneel down and pray to thank God for his protection and the the care of his angels uh, that that you know put a hedge around us so that my little nine-year-old daughter can go to sleep at night in her bed and not be afraid and my 13 year old son can do the same me and my wife can do the same we don't go to sleep at night uh, scared to death we we trust the Lord and thank God that all of the, uh, the peace that we do have is because of his protection. But the Bible predicts that humanity is going to uh, continue to veer away from God's will and his perfect plan and his law. And as time goes on, God is going to be withdrawing his hand and the devil is going to be doing his work of destruction. And we can certainly see that right now as we look around the world and as we look at the events that have happened in the last two months. A couple more texts and then we'll take your questions. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 19 nails this. It nails down what it says in the book The Great Controversy and the point that I'm making. <coughs> These disasters are signs that Jesus is getting closer to coming. And they are also signs that God is removing his protection from this world because of humanity's uh, increasing commitment to uh, wickedness and rebellion and violating his law. And it's, you know, I should say this too, that it's, it's uh, tragic 
that the innocent also often suffer with the guilty. Job was innocent, and uh, you know God allows this. But if we do, if we are fearing Him and putting Him first, and we do suffer uh, in an earthquake or a fire or a storm or a flood, which a lot of righteous people are suffering, just like Job was righteous, God wants us to be among that group that uh, holds holds fast our integrity, that we don't uh, blame God, we don't curse Him to his face like the devil said, but we trust him no matter what. As Job later on said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And at the end of Job's life, God repaid him. He, he restored what had been taken and God blessed him abundantly. And so God will make it up to us if we suffer in these things. Uh, anyway, Jeremiah 6, 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring calamity upon this people the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. Why deadly disasters? Why is God allowing these things? Well, here, O earth, here's the answer. Here, O people, here's the answer. The answer is because people as a whole, the majority of humanity, has uh, rejected God, rejected his words and his holy law. That's what's happening. And so God is allowing these calamities to strike this world. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm almost done. Thankfully, it's not all bad news. I don't want to depress you uh, at this webinar. Uh, ultimately, I want, to, I want to awaken you and uh, hope that God will convict you of the times in which we live and, and move you by the Holy Spirit to repentance and to faith in Jesus. But I want to give you a hope that this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of the road, what we see around us. It's not all doom and gloom. God has a beautiful plan to remake the heavens and the earth and to give us a brand new home if we stick with him like Job and hold on. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. The Bible says, Second Peter 3.10, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it will be burned up. So it's not just Northern California and parts of Santa Rosa and parts of Southern California and different places around the, the country and around the world where these fires, fires are taking place, but one of these days the whole earth is going to burn up. God's going to get rid of all sin and wickedness, and he's going to get rid of the devil too. Verse 11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What kind of people should you be? Should I be? And we should be like Job, fearing God and uh, living blameless lives and uh, hating evil because evil's evil is evil. And good is good. And we should love good and hate evil because it's the right thing to do. Holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm just, I'm so looking forward to this. I'm so looking forward. I mean, I love where I live in North Idaho. I love being out in the country, having a garden, having a fruit tree, fruit trees, and uh, you know, all the good things that, that God has given to me and my family. But I know that this world is not, it's not my final home. I have a, another home, a better home, much better. Uh, and in the midst of my own trials, uh, this, is what, this is what keeps me going. It says again, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Hallelujah. God is going to have a brand new world where uh, there's only goodness and love and truth and kindness and, uh, and all the things that are good. The animals will all be friendly. Uh, my, my kids are looking forward to that. We have... Right now, we have two dogs, uh, three cats, two fish, and a bird. And the kids just, you know, they're really looking forward to the day when all the animals all around the world will be friendly and uh, they can, you know, ride a lion and 
play with the giraffe and, and all, all of the th wonderful things that God has in store for us. Verse 14 says, Therefore, beloved, looking for, since you are looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Blameless, just like Job. God is developing Job's in these last days who understand the great controversy between good and evil who understand now in retrospect we can read the book of Job Job didn't understand but now we know uh, that the devil causes so so much destruction and that God protects his people when we follow him and uh, that he has good things in store for us uh, the last verse well it's actually almost the last verse second Peter chapter 3 and you can see that well Pastor Ron, put that back on the screen. There we go. Second Peter chapter 3, at the end of this chapter, the very last verse says, Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him, to him, be glory both now and forever. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful passage? Uh, the Bible talks about the grace of Jesus. Uh, yes, uh, we've all sinned yes we've all not been like job yes we've all broken god's law yes we've all uh, lived everything other than a blameless life but grace god's grace is sufficient for us jesus grace uh, is there for us he loves us and if we're willing to make a decision to give him our lives and turn to him and repent of our sins uh, his grace will wash away all of our sins. He'll clothe us with a perfect white robe of righteousness and he will surround us with uh, his arms of love which have uh, nail scars in his hands and in his feet uh, and in heaven there'll be one reminder of sin and that is the marks on Jesus body because of the cruel work that sin has, uh, has done uh, even to him, especially to him. And so be of good courage. Uh, Jesus loves you and there's good news ahead of us. He's coming. It's not all going to be uh, disastrous forever. There will be more. I hate to tell you, you know, the bad news is there's more disasters coming. But the good news is that when it's all over, when the dust settles, it's going to be so fantastic that we won't even remember the pain and suffering that we've been through in this, in this life. Resources. We have some resources on the screen. Uh, I mentioned the, f the flyer, uh, Fire from the Sky. And we also have, we have two flyers. We have one, The Coming Judgments of God, which is a, uh, talks about the Ten Commandments and God's law and what's happening in society and what's happening in the world. And also um, about grace and about Jesus Christ and his love. And then we also have Fire from the Sky, where we get into more details about the dreams that uh, this woman had in the 1800s and early 1900s, early 1900s, where she saw fireballs coming down from the sky and great destruction uh, and fires that couldn't be stopped. And we expect a lot more of these things to be happening in the days ahead. Plus, we also have a little pocket book. Uh, if you want more information on the coming judgments of God, and uh, our conviction is that, that ultimately whether God sends judgments or whether he withdraws his hands and lets the devil do what, what he does uh, so well, which is uh, to kill and murder and destroy, that these are all classified as uh, just judgments of God to uh, get humanity's attention and to lead us to repentance and to bring us back to him. So we have the flyer, and we also have a little book. These are great for sharing. Uh, they can, you can get them from Whitehorse Media. They're not expensive. The more you get, the price goes down. They can be given away easily, and people are interested. I mean, I tell you, right now, as all these things are happening in the world, people are more and more open and interested in getting a little track or a little book or something to read that helps them to understand what's happening in this world. And we want to do our part. That's what White Horse Media is all about. That's why we're doing this webinar, is to share this information with you and to encourage you to do what you can do while time, uh, while time remains. I sent this, this one flyer on the coming judgments of God to all of my relatives, especially during fire time in Los Angeles. And I said, hey, uh, please read this and, and realize that uh, more is coming and the time is running out. And we need, we need to get to know Jesus. 
uh, just FYI, we're also going to make this um, web link available uh, shortly. And so people that didn't get a chance to watch this live, uh, they can grab the link, they can click it, they can watch it. So this program has been, is, has been recorded and will be available for many others to watch and to share. And so that's what we hope will happen uh, through the Holy Spirit and with God's prompting to help, uh, help a lot of people to wake up and do their part. So it's time for questions. We've been going for about an hour and 20 minutes or so. I don't know how long we'll go, but I'm going to turn over to my computer here. And again, we've got people that have logged in from Canada, Poland, Costa Rica, Hong Kong, Portugal, France, different states throughout the country. Sharon says, thank you, Pastor Steve. You're welcome, Sharon. Uh, glad to do it. Uh, I, I haven't told anybody, at least not you, uh, watching now that I had a very difficult summer. Um, I had some real struggles, real trials, but the Lord brought me through and I am thrilled to be here and to be able to share this information. So, all right, well, we've got a lot of, uh, got a lot of uh, Andrew, uh, Daryl saying, amen, amen. Paula, thank you, Pastor Steve. Uh, peace when you have peace. Thank you, all of you. So let me take some questions here. Someone says, hi, from Australia. I was somebody else that I was just about to go to sleep, but not now. All right, questions. Let me see, what do we have here? Okay, there's a lot of, I'm trying, okay, here it says, uh, from Portugal, Pastor Steve, do you think these events are God's punishment on a soon-to-end world, or could this also be Satan manipulating the Earth's elements in order to create havoc? Uh, I, I think, you, you wrote this early in the uh, webinar, and I think I answered that question, uh, and I'll just restate it that uh, we do believe that these are God's judgments upon the earth. And those judgments take the form uh, of either God sending them or withdrawing his hand and letting the devil do what Great Controversy says on page five, uh, 489 and, or 589 and 590, what the devil does, just like in the book of Job. Uh, and that whether God sends judgments like in the flood or with Sodom and Gomorrah, or whether God allows the devil to do what he does, like in Job chapter 1, all of these are um, uh, designed to wake people up. They're, they're signs of the approaching end of the world. So yes, uh, emphatically, we believe that Jesus is coming. We don't know when. We don't set dates. You're not going to see anybody from Whitehorse Media set any dates. We try not to be uh, you know, date setters, but, but biblical and balanced and to do what the Lord wants. Okay, another question from Cece. Are these direct judgments from God himself or is it a loosening of the four winds where the enemy is given permission to do harm because people are turning away from God? Similar question uh, in Revelation chapter seven, verses one to four, the Bible talks about four angels holding the winds uh, until God's people are sealed. And then when they're sealed and they're, they're ready, then the winds will be let loose and everything's going to go crazy. We haven't seen anything yet compared to what's coming. If, if these are fireball connected or related fires, if they are, uh, th th they're minor com in comparison with what's coming. Uh, we don't believe, I don't believe that the Lord has completely loosed the winds yet. Uh, but the angels are starting, you know, to... Uh, to pull back their hands. And this, this Revelation chapter seven, again, tells us that, that God's forces of good are protecting this planet. The four corners of the earth represent the whole world, all around the world. And it just tells us that if it wasn't for God protecting us, we'd all be dead. And so we don't think the four winds have been that loose yet, not completely, uh, but it's coming. Okay, uh, Linny said, Pastor, during the tribulation when Christians will be attacked and killed, can you share what the Bible teaches on whether to fight against our attackers or not, or not to resist them? Uh, Linny, on our, on our website we have a book called End Time Delusions that deals with the whole topic of the tribulation. I don't really have time to go into all of that right now. 
uh, we believe at White Horse Media that uh, God's people are going to go through the final tribulation, uh, but we will be protected by the Lord, uh, just like the Israelites were protected in Egypt when the ten plagues fell all around them. At least they were protected during the last seven plagues, which parallels Revelation chapter 16, when the seven final plagues fall, God's people will be protected. So we, we believe we're going to be here uh, as far as whether we should be fighting back or not. Personally, I don't think so. Now, you know, you know if somebody broke into my house uh, tonight and attacked my wife and my kids, uh, I would not just sit there and only pray. I would try to try to defend my family. Well, that's me personally. But if we are being, uh, if if we're being persecuted in the name of Jesus, uh, if we if we take a stand against the mark of the beast, and the persecution hits us, uh, if we're suffering for righteousness' sake, I believe we should just trust the Lord and let happen what happens. Uh, you know, in other words, don't fight back. Jesus said, if we take the sword, we'll die by the sword. Uh, Daniel didn't fight back. He allowed them to, th his enemies, to throw him into the den of lions. And uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't fight the soldiers that tried to, you know, arrest them and throw them into the burning fire furnace. But because they were faithful, uh, God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Jesus was there with them in the fire, and he protected them. And uh, Daniel, as I tell my kids, uh, he... He slept, slept well with some furry pillows that night uh, inside the lion's den. So uh, our, our basic idea is that when the final times come and we're persecuted for keeping God's law and following Jesus Christ and not going along with the mark of the beast, that, that uh, God will protect us. And if he doesn't, then we, uh, we join the martyrs who have uh, lost their lives throughout history, but who will have uh, a glorious reward in the earth made new. So good question. Okay, let's see. Let's see what else we can get here. Uh, good afternoon, says Joseph. Greetings from San Diego. Lucio, greetings back. Okay, let's see. Questions. I'm looking for questions. It's hard to pick these questions because there's so many different comments that are coming in. Maybe next time Okay, where, where are we in Bible prophecy? Uh, we're, we're close to the end. I mean, I could go on and Daniel 2 has a prophecy and we're in the toes of the image. And you go down through the different prophecies. We're in the time right before the angels loose the winds. We're in the time of the end, Daniel 12.4. We're in the time when the birth pangs are increasing and Jesus is coming. So we don't know the day or the hour. Uh, Raimundo asked, he says, Jewish people can be good messengers. How can we reach them? I ask that because you are a Jew. God bless Pastor Steve. Uh, thank you. We have, a, uh, we have a DVD called The Ultimate Passover, which is specifically designed to reach Jewish people. Uh, we have a number of resources on our website. We have a little book called The Quest of a Jew, which is also very good to share with Jewish people. I have a lot of Jewish relatives, and my dad uh, is Jewish, but he, he's also a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, and my brother is um, growing in his, uh, his faith. Uh, I have different relatives who have um, learned about Jesus. Uh, and so, you know, not all of them, but, but many of them. And so I th I th I'm thankful for that, very thankful. In fact, the majority now of my relatives, my mother recently died, and she was not a believer. But uh, I'd have to you know, look at them all and count them all up. But anyway, uh, the majority uh, are developing a, a growing faith in Christ. So that's good, and we have resources to share with Jewish people. We know, we believe that God loves Jewish people. He loves Jews and Gentiles. Jesus was Jewish. Uh, the disciples were uh, mostly Jewish. The New Testament was written by Jews. Uh, Luke, well, actually all the disciples were, Jew were Jewish. Uh, Luke, who wrote, he was the only Gentile writer of any New Testament book. Uh, he wasn't Jewish, but the majority of the New Testament was written by Jews. So God loves Jews, and he wants to reach Jewish people with the good news that Jesus is their Messiah. 
and he paid the price on the cross for all of our sins. Okay, let's see. Uh, Pastor Steve from Maryland, do you think we have entered into the little time of trouble or are we past that? Uh, the, the big time of trouble is when the angels loose the winds and everything goes. Daniel 12 verse 1 describes the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Uh, we don't believe we've reached that time yet. When the big time of trouble comes, it's, everybody's made their choice. That's after the mark of the beast. That's when the, the doors of uh, heaven close and everybody's either in or out. They're with Jesus or they're not. And then the plagues fall. And the seven last plagues fall upon those who get the mark. That time hasn't come yet. As to whether we're in the little time of trouble, uh, prior to the big time of trouble, um, you know, I hesitate, I hesitate to say definitively, yes, we are, although I think that it's not far away. And that what we're seeing, what we've seen in the last two months just tells me that uh, things are going to get worse and that there will be more to come and that uh, we're, getting, we're getting close. Okay, Sharon said, should we move out into the country? if we aren't there yet. Now, God's gonna have to direct you as to what you should do. We don't, we don't tell people what to do. We don't say, you know, we are uh, a mouthpiece for God telling you what you should do right now concerning whether you should sell your house or not. But uh, those of us that live out here, uh, we have sensed the Lord leading us to move into the country, definitely. Country living is uh, safer, all things considering. We live on a, my family lives on a very quiet street and compared to the inner city of Los Angeles, uh, it's a lot safer. So it's, uh, it's safer, it's healthier, the air is better. It's also better for our spiritual lives because we don't have as many temptations surrounding us. Certainly if you have children, it's, uh, it's very good to live in the country. They can be more in contact with nature. And so you, you have to pray about that, uh, but we believe that uh, generally speaking, the Lord is calling his people to, uh, to live in, in the country and to live in places that are, that are better for us and healthier for us and easier for us to get close to God being surrounded by nature. But, uh, you know, cities are big these days. I grew up in Los Angeles and it's a big city and God needs people in L.A. and in New York and in Detroit and in Chicago. And uh, so he'll have to guide you and you will have to pray for his leading. Okay, is it time to leave the cities? Same basic question. I think the, the quicker you can, if God leads you to do it, the better. Because, you know, once you're, when you're in a city, uh, when, when things really get bad, it, it's going to be hard to get out. You've seen these uh, traffic jams of people, you know, trying to get away from the approaching hurricanes. If you're stuck in a city, it, it life is just going to be a lot more, uh, it's going to be a lot crazier and, uh, you know, more perilous. So we think it's a good idea, but we're not going to tell you what to do. Okay, uh, Terry asks, does our character completely change before Christ comes? When is that completed? Uh, Good question. I think personally that we're going to be growing throughout eternity. Uh, character development does not cease at any point, but Jesus does want us to overcome sin in this life. He wants us to be commandment keepers in this life. Uh, Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of of Jesus. God is looking for commandment keepers, just like the book of Job. Just like Job, it says he was, uh, he was blameless and he was upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. And uh, if we have you know, sins in our lives, now's the time to give them up. If we have defects in our characters, now's the time to let Jesus, by his grace, change us. Uh, the verse that I read in 2 Peter says, be diligent that you may be found of him by him in peace without spot and blameless, 2 Peter 3, 14. So uh, I believe that God can give us the victory over sin and that we can truly keep his commandments and, be, and live blameless lives, just like Job 
you know, Satan may uh, challenge that. But that's what he does. He's a challenger. But, you know, God said, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? Look at him. He's there and he really is blameless. And Job went, and Satan went, ah, you know, he did all of his uh, shenanigans. But that shows me that God can have people who follow him completely. So that's my answer to that. Uh, another question here. Pastor, what do you think about the meeting on October 31 when evangelicals and Catholics are saying it is the end of the Reformation? Good question. I think a lot about that. A uh, lot, to, lot to think about that. Um, today is Wednesday, October 18. A week from tomorrow, which is a Thursday, on October 26, I'll be at the headquarters of the Three Angels Broadcasting Network, 3ABN in, in Illinois. And uh, the title we just finalized today, I'll be doing a live interview with one of the uh, hosts. I don't know whether it'll be Danny Shelton or uh, C.A. Murray. I've been there many times, but the topic is 500 years from Luther and Earth's final crisis. Uh, I believe that the churches, and I was just watching something today, a big event scheduled for Kansas City on October 26 to uh, 28 called Keros, which means time for action. And this is going to be a, a large meeting in Kansas City with uh, charismatics and evangelicals and Catholics and uh, Orthodox and Jewish uh, or Messianic believers coming together to heal the wounds of division and to come together in unity in the name of Jesus. And uh, I believe in unity, but that unity must be based on truth. When you read John 17, Jesus prayed that his disciples would be one, but in John 17, 17, he said, uh, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. And true unity in Christ is also a unity based on scripture, based on the word of God, and we cannot compromise that. I think that the, uh, the movement to unite with Rome is a big mistake, huge mistake. Uh, and I don't have time to go into everything that we know in the light of prophecy. If you read the book End Time Delusions, uh, it's, a, it, it's well documented on our website, End Time Delusions, under books. And it deals with uh, the Reformation and uh, Bible prophecy, Daniel 7, the little horn, Revelation 13, the beast, Revelation 17, the mother of harlots. And uh, God says, come out of her, my people, in Revelation 18, verse 4. And uh, really, Rome, you know, Rome has not changed that much from the days of Luther. 500 years ago, on October 31, uh, 1517, Luther nailed his 95 theses, they're called, on the door of the castle church in, in Wittenberg, or Wittenberg, Germany. And that's what sparked the Reformation. And 500 years from then uh, is October 31 of 2017. And so churches are celebrating the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. And this event in Kansas City is designed to celebrate 500 years since the Reformation and other anniversaries. But here's something that a lot of people don't know. And I'll, and I'll talk about this on the 3ABN interview that uh, 2017 is also the anniversary of the 100 years from the uh, apparent apparitions of Mary in Portugal uh, in Fatima. And the Catholic Church has offered an indulgence to those who go to Fatima during the 100 year anniversary, which uh, is in 2017. And Luther posted his protest, which was against indulgences where uh, the Catholic Church sold uh, indulgences if you give money to help them build St. Peter's Church you could be forgiven for all your sins uh, just by giving the money and you could buy people out of purgatory and the reality is that the Roman Church still issues indulgences and they're 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 doing it this year in commemoration of the 100 year anniversary of the uh, apparitions of Mary. Now, I don't believe that those apparitions really came from Mary, or at least the revelation of Mary. I don't believe it really was Mary. I believe it was a devil, a demon impersonating Mary, and that it's a massive deception. So 
the Roman Church still offers indulgences. The Roman Church still believes in purgatory. The Roman Church still prays to uh, Mary and the saints, whereas the Bible says in uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, there's only one mediator between God and men. It is the man, Christ Jesus. And there's a whole host of biblical reasons why the Roman Catholic Church, uh, as sincere as many, many, many Catholics are, uh, really has strayed away big time from Bible truth. And I believe God has a lot of Catholics that he's uh, reaching out to and he loves very much. And he's reaching out to and uh, trying to lead them to the Bible and to Jesus Christ. And so anyway, that's, that's a good question. And I encourage you to, if you want to, uh, eight days from now, it's going to be at 8 o'clock Central Time, 6 o'clock Pacific Time. You can go on to 3abn.org. You can log in to 3ABN's website, the Three Angels Broadcasting Network, and you can watch my interview uh, live about Luther, the Reformation, today, the Catholic Church, the Mark of the Beast, the continuing Reformation, how the Reformation is not dead, it's still alive, and, uh, and we want to be part of it. All right, well, I just got a signal that we need to wind this up. So I want to, uh, I want to thank you for logging in and tuning in uh, from, from around the world. I've got a whole host of, uh, here's Mark. Hey, Mark. Mark said, victory, Steve, amen. I remember Mark uh, Shipowick. Uh, we've written each other quite a bit. Robert and Daryl, and there's just so many of you. So if I had time, I'd spend more time with you, but we'll do this again. Uh, it wasn't that hard for us to pull this off. We thank God for all the equipment and the, t the staff that I work with, the team of people that are here uh, in Priest River, Idaho. Uh, you probably know Whitehorse Media is a faith ministry. Uh, it's your prayers and your, uh, your contributions that help us to keep going and to be able to do this. And so thank you uh, for being a part of all of this. And we just, we thank God, praise God. I want to read one last text and then we'll have a prayer. So if you would like to follow with me in Psalm 46, verse 1, I want to close with an encouraging verse in the time of uh, terrible devastation. And I encourage you to pray for the people that are in the path of these fires, those that have lost homes uh, and lost everything in Southern California, Northern California, those that are in Houston, those that are uh, in, in Florida, those that are in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, there's just so many people that are suffering as a result of these disasters. So we encourage you to pray for them and pray for yourselves and pray for us that God will continue to give us the strength to do webinars like this. As things continue on and escalate, we want to be right here dealing with the big issues and, uh, and, and sharing God's word and the love of Jesus Christ with as many as possible. Psalm 46, verse 1. The Bible says that God is our refuge and our strength. We ultimately want you to look to the Lord, not to man. God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in trouble. As times of trouble increase, God cares for his people. And uh, he will help us. And, and some of us, we may die in a storm or a fire. But God will make it up to us. And others of us, he'll, he'll do miraculous things and he'll... He'll bring us through. What, but whatever happens, uh, if we trust in the Lord, he w we will discover that he is a refuge and a strength and a present help in trouble. And we will be with him and with each other uh, in a better land sometime soon. May that day come <laughs> as soon as possible. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, dear God, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here and to share your word with so many from different places around the world. And we just pray together. I'm sure there are many out there that are praying right now with me. We pray together in the name of Jesus that you will uh, be with your world, be with your people. Help us to share the truth of God and the word of God and the love of God while we still have time. Be with those that are, that are suffering because of these disasters. And may Jesus come soon and take us Take us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.